Hi, Colonial Woods, Pastor Phil, joining you this midweek just for an encouraging word as we as we practice viral faith in this particular day and uh, wanted to share an encouraging word with you. Before we get into today's message, I uh, wanted to share with you just a little bit about some updates, what's going on around the church. Uh, obviously, with uh, the governor's order from this past Monday of us working from remote areas and homes to basically stay in place and stay safe is kind of the concept. Uh, our offices are closed. Um, you can still communicate with us. We're working remotely. Uh, so if you have a need, you're still welcome to email us. Uh, and you can get the, a hold of that email list uh, by just simply going to our website or if you call the church office at 984-5571, uh, you will get a directory of names. And one of the options when you leave a, a voicemail, for example, for Pastor Phil, is to notify me. And what that will do is it'll actually send me an email. I'll give you a call back uh, and I will communicate with you directly uh, so that we can set up a time together. Uh, we're meeting by phone. We're meeting by Zoom. We're meeting by FaceTime. Uh, lots of different ways, and we still want to be able to come alongside of you. Now, if you take your Bibles today, we're actually going to look at, look at two different passages in the Gospels that are the same story. They're just two different viewpoints. One is out of Matthew chapter 8, verse 23, and the other one is out of Mark chapter 4, verse 35. It's the story of how Jesus calms the storm, and over the last uh, few weeks, I've been reminded of the fact that uh, I looked at these passages last year, and there's a particular fa uh, phrase that's been sticking out to me over the last couple of weeks that I wanted to talk with you about tonight. Um, when I, I like to hunt, some of you know that I like to hunt. One of the things uh, that they often tell us, especially when we're preparing for a hunt that's going to be remote, uh, whether it be in the mountains, whether it be uh, uh, in, uh, in Alaska, wherever it's at, they often will tell you bring rain gear because you never know when you're going to be caught in a storm. And specifically, when you go into the mountains, they tell you that you need to prepare for very quick storms to come in. Uh, it's not unusual at all uh, for you to be in the mountains and for it to get into the 70s and 80s during the daytime. And then within just a couple of hours, uh, you can be experiencing hypothermia. And so you need to have the gear with you uh, to just basically deal with sudden storms that come up. And there were a few things that I've noticed that, that to me just simply, uh, they connect with what we're going through right now. First of all, uh, when you're in the mountains especially, there are storms that you see coming, but you don't think they're ever going to get to you. Right? Does that ring a bell with some of you? You see it out there, you know it's out there, but you just assume that it'll never reach you. Um, another storm that oftentimes will happen in the mountains is that you see the storms coming, but you thought you'd have more time before it got to you. That happens a lot. Uh, it is very deceptive how you can see these storm clogs way off in the distance and then very quickly, boom, they are right there in front of you. Number three, there are storms that you see, but you didn't realize that they would be near as bad as what you thought. Uh, if you watch the weather, uh, you're up in the mountains, you're looking at them, you see the storm, but you're thinking this probably won't be that big of a deal. And then you find out it's a blizzard. Uh, they can take you by surprise. Number four, some storms you just simply didn't see coming. They creep up on you and they have a way of impacting you. All of those truths are so applicable to what we're going through right now. Um, you might have thought this was so far off, it was never going to get to you. You thought it would pass us by. Um, you didn't think it'd be near this severe. And probably all of us in one degree or another just simply uh, probably had that impact. I, I'll give you the last one. Sometimes they're just internal storms. I will tell you, I have been in a couple of situations out in the wilderness, out in a boat, out in on a on a horse, going in the middle of the night through some pretty creepy territory, uh, walking through areas where bears were on the pl pr the prowl. The problem with those areas is not what's just going on around you; it's what is going on inside of you. And I have found that the internal storms are just as impactful as the storms that are going on around us outside. Well, fortunately, Jesus knows how to deal with storms, right? And as we get into this passage in Matthew chapter 8, Mark chapter 4, 
What I'm going to do is I'm actually going to morph the two passages together. You're welcome to have both passages open, but I'm going to morph them together and try to give us the full picture of what the gospel writers tell us about that event. Now, I want you to know that just because one adds in a little bit more information than the other doesn't mean that they're contradicting each other. It's just that each of the gospel writers really is telling us a viewpoint and they're actually writing to a specific audience. And so Matthew's writing primarily to a Jewish audience. Mark is writing to a Roman audience. And so understand that sometimes we, we don't tell all of the story that doesn't apply to certain uh, individuals that we're speaking to. And so when you see them both together, you're really getting a great full picture. Um, also under con uh, understand the context of when the message was given. In Matthew chapter 5 through 7, if you're reading out of Matthew, we see the Sermon on the Mount. So Jesus is giving the cliff notes on the kingdom. And then in chapter 8, we see Jesus doing incredible miracles. Um, he is, uh, he's healing a man with leprosy. In fact, he does so with just five words. I'm willing, I'm willing, be clean. Um, we see him heal the servant of the centurion uh, when he just speaks 11 words. And even those 11 words, he didn't have to speak. He basically says, go, it's going to be done as, as you've said. Um, he heals Peter's mother-in-law, and it doesn't indicate he said anything, all right? He just simply touches her, she's healed. And over and over in that passage, Jesus heals many, he drives out demons. It's within that context, and then right before the storm hits, Jesus says, okay, now I gotta warn you, it will not always be easy to be a follower of me. All of that's the context, and then the storm hits. Here's what it says. Then he got into the boat, <clears throat> and his disciples followed him. Without warning, a furious storm came up on the lake so that the waves swept over the boat and nearly swamped the boat. But Jesus was sleeping, Mark says, in the front of the boat on a cushion. And the disciples went and they woke him saying, Lord, save us. Don't you care? We're going to drown. In other words, Lord, we're going to die. Do you even care that we're going to die? And he replied, you of little faith, why are you so afraid? Then he got up and he rebuked the winds and the waves. Mark says this. He said, quiet, peace, be still. And it was completely calm. The men were amazed and asked, what kind of man is this? Even the winds and the waves obey him. Now, I find it interesting that some of the temptations of the disciples were the same temptations that we often face when we're in storms. Um, I, can I just share with you, never in Scripture is it ever wrong to complain to God, but it is always wrong to complain about God. And it's interesting, some of the temptations they faced are the same temptations that we face. Real quickly, um, Lord, don't you care? It's almost an accusation that they give to him. It's like, Lord, do you even care about us? Sometimes we, we feel that way, don't we? Um, you have a family member in the hospital. You have a family member who's passed away. Um, you're having a hard time making your payments. Um, uh, the storm is approaching you. Lord, do you even really care about me? Number two, uh, Lord, are you even paying attention to me? They said, Lord, don't you care that we're going to drown? As if to indicate to him, We've got stuff going on, Jesus, that you don't even realize is going on. Do you, do you notice what's going on? And I think sometimes we feel like God isn't really paying attention. Number three, there's an inferred accusation in this passage. Lord, you, you broke your promise. Now, Jesus didn't break his promise. In fact, Jesus specifically indicated to them before they got into the boat, it's not always going to be easy and smooth sailing when you follow me. But the understanding was, at least from them, that as long as we're with Jesus, nothing's ever going to happen to us. I really find that to be a common temptation that believers have. Even though we would never say we believe it, it is something that oftentimes we evidence because when we go through trials, immediately we start to question God's love for us, God's loyalty to us. And frankly, we, we believe God hasn't kept his promises to us. Number four. Lord, 
it doesn't seem like you could possibly calm this storm. Again, look at the context. I know you can heal someone. <clears throat> but healing an individual of something like leprosy is nothing like what we're facing right now when we're talking about a storm that threatens to take us all under. It's a temptation that can... In other words, there are varying degrees of what God is able to do. Number five, Lord, I'm not sure my faith is going to really hold out. Now that's a temptation and it's a reality. And when Jesus looks at them, I think one of the reasons Jesus says some pretty harsh words to them when he says, um, you of little faith, Jesus is not criticizing the size of their faith. What Jesus is really indicating is the, is the enduring nature of their faith. God doesn't really ever criticize the size of our faith. Jesus said, if you have the faith of a mustard seed, you can, you can say to this mountain, uh, be thrown into the sea. So Jesus indicates you don't really have to have huge size of faith, but your faith does have to endure. And it's interesting, it's almost as if they're indicating by the nature of their questions, Lord, we're really not sure that our faith is going to hold out. But what strikes me in this passage and what has been really grabbing me is just simply the words that Jesus spoke to the storm peace quiet be still um <clears throat> there are two greek words the word first one for the word peace or the word quiet it's the word siupa and it's the word to involuntarily bring quietness upon someone um, it's a little bit like uh, Zechariah, who's the father of, of uh, John the Baptist in the book of Luke. It says that when he questioned the angel Gabriel, that he was not able to speak until John the Baptist was born. He, he had words. He wanted to say something. He could not speak. There was an involuntary um, quietness that was brought upon him I, I i when i read this passage sometimes i laugh i i think my first and second grade teachers would have loved to have that ability uh for me i i was that kid in school uh you remember back when they wouldn't give you a b c's and when i was at that age when they would give you a plus um, a check mark if everything was okay if you were a c uh they'd give you a minus with a circle around it if you were not doing quite what you should and then they just gave you a minus i got a lot of minuses and i got a lot of minuses with circles when it came to being quiet in class. Um, I uh, will shock you. I actually had a problem keeping my mouth quiet. Uh, and I know my teachers would have loved to have had that. It's like, a, it's, you know what it is? It's like a, a divine librarian who says, shh, right? And has the ability to immediately create an involuntary quietness. So he says to the storm, peace, quiet. And then he uses the phrase, be still. The Greek word for that, it means to put a muzzle on a dog. It, it means to have the ability to not just bring quietness, but actually keep any movement from happening. I love that phrase. Siupa. Peace. Quiet. Be still. And it says that immediately the storm calmed. The winds, the waves died down and became calm. And the question that I've been thinking about over these last two weeks is, um, why did Jesus say that? Mark, by the way, it, it says in Matthew that he rebuked, right? So he does so in a stern forceful manner it says that he rebuked the the storm mark says he did it by saying siupa and the, the next word there is a uh, uh, siupa it, it, it's the idea of of peace and 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 then i'm going to involuntarily muzzle you why, why did jesus say that well number one jesus speaks peace to storms because he knows who he is you see, isn't it interesting? Even after he calmed the storm, everybody started to ask, who is this guy? But Jesus knew exactly who he was. He understood that he was the calmer of storms. 
that he was actually the giver of peace. Scripture says that, that he is our peace. He's able to uh, break down the dividing wall of hostility. He's able to bring our peace with God, but he's also able to bring our peace with one another and our peace in life that he's able to do that. And that's why, by the way, Paul says in Philippians chapter uh, 3, verse 6 and 7, he says, Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and petition and thanksgiving, present your request to God, and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your mind in Jesus Christ. Paul understood who the peace giver was. He understood the one who's able to calm us in storms because he understood who he is. Jesus had no problem speaking to the storm because he understood exactly who he was. Number two, he understood he had the authority and the right to speak to the storm. Look what he says. It says, he said, peace, be still. He understood by this time fully that he was not only the Son of God, but that he and the Father are one. That he understood that he was the one who set the laws of creation into existence. That he's the one who created the heavens and the earth. He's the one who created the water. He's the one who created everything that there is. Of course, he has the ability to have authority and power over the storm. And so he spoke these words because he knew who he was. And he also understood that he had the authority to do so. The third reason he speaks to the storm is exactly because he hadn't forgotten his promises to his people to those who had been called by him. They said, don't you care? And Jesus' action declared abundantly clear, of course I care. Of course I care what you're going through. Lord, do you care that we have individuals who are getting this coronavirus? Do you care that my, my family member passed away? Do you care that we can't make our mortgage payment? Do you care that we're scared to death? Do you care that there's uncertainty? Do you care that my child ran away from home? Do you care that my spouse is walking away from me? Do you care? Of course I care. And the promises that he makes in the storm is simply our promises today. I promise you, I'm bigger than this storm. I promise you, I'm going to see you through the storm. I promise you, I can silence the storm. I promise you, I won't waste this storm. God has a way of speaking to us in the storm, getting our attention like no other times in our life. I was blessed and challenged this last Sunday, 12 o'clock noon, around the world. Millions and millions of Christians were called to prayer to ask God to do a miracle. Isn't it interesting what God is saying to the church in the middle of this storm? We're looking at what church is really all about we're we're looking and evaluating how we do ministry and how we're going to do ministry in the future we're having opportunities today that perhaps we've never had before you see god never wastes the storm and sometimes he speaks peace to the storm and sometimes he just holds you steady and gives you safety through the storm. When I was uh, finishing up this little note for this morning, or this, uh, this uh, yeah, this morning when I was studying on this, um, 
I, I remembered a song from years ago, and I'll be honest, I can't remember. In fact, there have been a number of author, uh, 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 Christian artists who recorded it. But real quickly, I looked up the words of this song, and I thought they were so pertinent uh, for today. Here's what it says. All who sail the sea of faith find out before too long how quickly blue skies can grow dark and gentle winds can grow strong. Suddenly, fear is like white water pounding on the soul. Still, we sail on knowing that our Lord is in control. Sometimes he calms the storm. With a whispered, peace be still, he can settle any sea. But it doesn't mean that he will. Sometimes he holds us close and lets the winds and the waves go wild. Sometimes he calms the storm. Other times he calms his child. He has a reason for each trial that we pass through life. And though we're shaken, we cannot be pulled apart from Christ. No matter how the driving rain beats down on us who hold on to faith, a heart of trust will always be a quiet, peaceful place. Sometimes he calms the storm. With a whispered peace be still, he can settle any sea. But it doesn't mean he will. Sometimes he holds us close and lets the winds and the waves go wild. Sometimes he calms the storm. And other times he calms his child. My deep prayer is that for you, for us as a church family, as a body of believers around this country and around this world, certainly I pray that God speaks peace be still to this storm. And that in a miraculous move, God, as quickly as this whole thing sprung up, that it will also die down. But if not, then my prayer is for us to be people of enduring faith that hold on to the one who gives us peace, the one who gives us of calm. And I pray that in a world that is going crazy and in, around those who are absolutely frantic, that the peace and the confidence and the assurance that shows in our lives will be so contagious that we can introduce them to the one who is able to chase storms. Father, I pray, I pray this midweek for the ones who are struggling, and I know that's real, and I know that is not just age-related. I know there are parents that are deeply concerned for their, their kids, young and old. Lord, I know there are young people there are young people that even though uh, the stats show that many times they're not the ones that are impacted as greatly, Father, they are, uh, they're being consumed right now and inundated by all the news they're hearing. They're listening to the voices and the voices are having a real impact. Father, um, some are struggling with the uncertainty of this whole situation. Some, Lord, they have an aging loved one, parent or spouse, maybe even a grandparent. Father, all of us are walking through a, a very unsettling, uncertain time. My prayer. My prayer is that, Lord, we would see you for who you are and the authority that you have in these days. And that you would settle us with an incredible confidence that knows we are yours. We are your child. And that you're able to give peace. Give the peace, we pray. Right? Peace, peace. Wonderful peace. Coming down from the Father above. Sweep over my spirit forever, I pray. In the fathomless billows of love. Bring your peace, Lord. In Jesus' name. Amen. God bless.